Naval documentation showed the ships changed course to avoid the unknown vessels, but the contacts continued intermittently. At 10.39 p.m., when the Maddox and C. Turner Joy radars indicated one enemy vessel had closed to within 7,000 yards, the C. E. Turner Joy was ordered to open fire, and the Maddox soon followed. For the next several hours, the destroyers, covered by the Ticonderogas and the Constellation's aircraft, reportedly evaded torpedoes and fired on their attackers. The controversy over the incidents of these days is well known. But to the men who were there, there was no doubt. In Stockdale's words, I flew so low, there was salt spray on my windshield, and I still didn't see a thing. Meaning he never saw torpedoes or any evidence that the U.S. ships had been fired upon. The captain of the Ticonderoga's Attack Squadron 56, Commander Wesley L. McDonald concurred. He didn't see anything that night, except the Maddox and the Turner Joy. Turner After this flight, he and those in his command met behind closed doors, and each wrote accounts of what they did and did not see. Stockdale then locked these reports in his safe. The next morning... Commander James Stockdale was ordered to lead the first U.S. airstrike on North Vietnam. The target, the tar was the North Vietnamese Navy Oil Reserve. America was now at war. At the same time, coordinated attacks from F-8s, Sky Raiders, and Skyhawks launched from the USS Constellation bombed and destroyed targets on Ben 3 naval base. Quang Ki, Han Mei Island, and Han Ji's inner harbor. The mission was a success, with 90% destruction of the oil fields achieved. And as a result, Stockdale, on his second tour of duty, was given command of Air Wing 16 on board the USS Orensky. For his prowess as an air commander and for his ability to survive in the unforgiving world of naval aviation, Stockdale was given command of an air wing. On September 9, 1965, during his second tour in the Gulf, Stockdale was once again rocketing off a carrier. We were assigned to Thanwa Bridge Strike the last day of our in uh, at sea period. We were going to Hong Kong the next day. I let the Marines run, take their own airplanes. They were going to take all the F-8s. I just wanted myself to be there as a kind of a in case. And we had about uh, 27 planes going with us that day, I think. What should have been a routine mission began to turn bad. Uh, we uh, were just reaching the beach when we when sent ahead a weather plane and and, uh, and he said uh, it's zero zero at the bridge. By that he meant that the visibility was zero at sea level. Uh, it was a uh, impossible uh, target to hit under the conditions that we had in the weather. So uh, I hadn't assigned myself as a, a wingman, but we had a, the executive of 163 was right there with me. He said, I'll go with you. And uh, we went up to, uh, uh, all, this was all downhill. All we had to do was go up and, and uh, get rid of our bombs. And these were smaller bombs on the A-4s. 
I had found a, an area up to the north where I had almost always brought my excess bombs back and dropped them into a rail yard where, where boxcars were parked. I figured, parked. I figured they did some good. I'd been up there the day before. <clears throat> when we uh, roll in at low level, we were going to use this, what they call the snake eye delivery technique, which is low altitude, flat to the ground. Suddenly, the safe target erupted in a hail of fire. I had just pickled off the bombs when I heard this, this boom, boom, boom over to the right. And this a loud engine in that airplane, but I was close enough to this thing to see a, 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 a wheeled vehicle on which was mounted a 57 millimeter gun. They weren't weren't there yesterday, but here they were. And I had a plane on fire, and uh, and I was out out of that plane in the ejection seat, and uh, uh, we were <clears throat> uh, we were treetop level. We were pretty low, so I had a very short ride to the uh, ground. Stockdale was out of the plane, but the danger was not over. I could see the uh, bullets ripping my parachute. I landed, I hooked a tree, but that didn't last long. I, uh, I was finally on the ground with my, uh, on my own feet when the mob, which was thundering down the street, it's like every, every little town in Illinois, every little town in the world, they've got a bunch of uh, teenage or early 20s goons who were, uh, you know, they're going to defend the honor of the city, and this was a, and boy, they hit me like a, a pack of, like a, a quarterback sack, and then I had about a, had about a minute of being twisted and bent and kicked, and but it was, I wasn't really conscious of what was happening, except that. I was being bashed heavily, and then a guy with a, p a pith helmet, I, I saw his helmet later, he blew a whistle, and that, that ended that phase. And this guy, civilian with a pith helmet, pith, uh, took charge. The hotshot pilot was now a POW. I arrived in prison in a, in a uh, stretcher that had been put in the back of an old truck uh, uh, that I finally was put in to get, get up to Hanoi. It was Sunday morning. I looked out there and I saw that prison and uh, I, I uh, the, the driver of the truck went in to rouse somebody and uh, then the, uh, the, the, the officer came out with him and uh, they were saw me in the structure and they were going to have some men haul me in but I I looked at the the, the scene of a kind of a rainy uh, Sunday morning in Hanoi not knowing that I would never ever see that street for uh, seven and a half years any time they carried me out of that prison or took me out I was blindfolded and handcuffed so, I mean, you know, it, 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 this was not going to be a prison camp where you s sat around the fire and talked about home. 